All right, either part two or section two, whichever, however I end up editing this. All right, so the last part of establishing why um, Rayma's death is scripturally inaccurate. I had begun to talk already about why I think this is wrong. And um, you know what? I, I think I'm tired of being polite. People try to be so polite in their criticism of this show. Some people were like, yeah, this isn't biblical, but the show's still pretty good. No. Mm -mm. Are there things The Chosen does that I think are decent? Well, yeah. Sort of. Um, I think some of the messages they say on forgiveness, um, some of the things they say about faith are probably true. Um, when they deviate least from scripture, they portray miracles. Yeah, uh, I think that that's done fairly well. There are some changes that are more problematic, but for the most part, they've done a decent job portraying stuff when they actually skip to scripture. Stick to scripture. My question is, though, that why don't they just stick to scripture the entire time? Now, one of my complaints with season three that is related to this um, is that they had Jesus meet with the Roman leader, Quintus, whatever his name is. Uh, this never happened in scripture. It's actually important that it never happened. Jesus didn't acknowledge the Romans as a threat because they weren't. Had he acknowledged them as a threat, it would have changed a lot. People were looking to him to lead a revolt against the Roman Empire. The show, The Chosen, has actually alluded to this expectation a couple times since Simon the Zealot was one of the people who joined him. And that's what zealots were, rebels against the Roman Empire. Now the Romans were jerks, to be sure. Though their corruption that we know the Roman Empire for didn't start till hundreds of years after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. At the time he was alive, the Romans were cruel, but they weren't complete tyrants. They allowed the Jews to worship in their own temples. Uh, the Roman centurion that Jesus like healed, who they're representing with Gaius in the show, I mean, he healed the servant of, not him, actually donated to the Jews' temple and was very kind to the Jews. They've tried to like portray that on the show decently, though I think they could have just stuck with the actual scriptural thing he did, which was help them. He wasn't getting pushed around by superior not allowed to help the Jews. That's complete fabrication. One of my issues actually with the way they portray these characters is when they take away from how good they were in order to make them look more human. They had enough problems. You don't need to add more. But they do. They make the disciples out to be even worse at times than they actually were. I'm like, give the guys some credit. Okay, they were following around Jesus. I think all of us would behave better for the most part if we were around Jesus all the time instead of just sometimes like and like Mary Magdalene's whole like relapse that never happened I can't see that actually happening for anyone who followed Jesus so another issue I had the reason this matters for the Romans though is it's historically inaccurate not just biblically inaccurate true uh, persecution of Christians did not start till again well after Jesus had died I think as much as decades after Jesus had died, but definitely not immediately after. The Jews persecuted Christians, then the Romans did because it was causing so many issues that the Romans began to, I guess, see it as a civil threat. That was after, not before. And Pilate only crucified Jesus, as I'm sure this show is going to portray, because the Jews, like, pressured him into it which shows that the Sanhedrin had enough power at the time to bother the Roman Empire because their influence was big enough where they didn't want to upset the Jewish population. So because the oppression was more manageable and bearable then, the Jews didn't like it because the Romans were pagans, but they weren't all miserable. And uh, plenty of them were miserable because of other Jews, not just the Romans, so there was that too. All this context matters because a Roman soldier would not have killed a Jewish woman for literally no reason, especially not for being at a public meeting. You know, the rabbis would have been more likely to be killed for like starting like the controversy with Jesus to begin with, not a random passerby. 
Um, as far as I understand it, that was happening. Like they would kill people who were causing insurrections, but they wouldn't kill people who were just standing around. That would have made big waves, uh, which I think is what they're going to have it do. I haven't watched the next episode yet. But the thing is, if that happened, it would have totally changed the ending of Jesus's ministry. Uh, also, having Jesus run from the Romans, pathetic. Jesus never ran from the Romans once. The Jews did try to mob him. He didn't run. He disappeared from among them. It's one of his miracles. He never ran from anyone. And uh, there are times they mobbed him, but they didn't lay a hand on him because he was divinely protected. He wouldn't have run. His disciples didn't run until like after Jesus was taken away from among them because strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. That was what was prophesied. So it's actually, it's an important doctrinal thing that they never ran until Jesus was gone. Because the point is when Jesus was with them, they were braver, they were bolder. Without him, they were weak until they received the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, which is the spirit of God. So they were again bolder. The point is they had supernatural strength. I can't imagine non-Christians would care about this detail. But if you're a Christian, it's very important to our doctrine to know that Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Without him, we can do nothing. These, it's not just words. It was literally what was shown through the disciples' actions whenever Jesus was not with them. Or they were arguing and they were afraid. But they didn't die. Never. So, again, this is historically inaccurate. And thematically inaccurate. It would change, like I said, everything. They, there's the amount of changes it would take a whole nother video one of those like what if history videos could be made about how much it would change if one of Jesus' disciples had been, even a woman had been killed before and I don't know what excuse the show has made or is going to make about this they're already getting a lot of backlash for it I don't care what their excuse is they've crossed a line they crossed a line already actually I saw this coming after they like, had Jesus talk to Quintus, uh, like I said in the previous season, I knew that they were already going too far. <sighs> that never happened, and it never would have happened. The Romans wouldn't have given Jesus's, like, following more credence by acknowledging it until it was a problem. You acknowledge something, you make people think you're afraid of it. They didn't care. Like I said, they gave the Jews a lot of religious freedom. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. That's probably actually why they let him go around doing what he did, because that's what rabbis did. They just taught people because he wasn't teaching insurrection, they let him. He was teaching brotherly love, and the Romans didn't have a problem with that. Romans also went to get baptized by John the Baptist and hear him. And John addressed the Romans directly, and they didn't do a thing to him. They only arrested him when he attacked, uh, I should say criticized, the Jewish king, who was the one who had him arrested, not the Romans. The Romans were surprisingly chilled that time in history. Again, after the time of Nero, they persecuted Christians heavily. Nero hated Christians. He was insane. But that came, I think, at least a hundred years after Jesus died. I, I may not be right about that. You can look it up if you want to know. But all I know is it was quite a bit after all, the, all these events. I believe even after all his original disciples had already been martyred was when Nero came to power. And the Roman persecution of Christians was really horrible but eventually it died down because as you know we have the holy roman empire and they became much more supportive of christianity in later centuries until eventually they fell into corruption the romans are always made out to be the bad guys now but they weren't always bad guys there was good ones and bad ones as i said the centurion was a pretty good guy he was very nice to the jews he was very respectful of their religion jewish people asked jesus to heal his servant because they said he's a good man for even for a Roman like he's a good man you know so you know uh, yeah I think that that is enough reason to assume that this entire scene is ridiculous it was also shot ridiculously as I said before but that's a minor complaint it's just cinematography wise they've done a lot better so I'm baffled by why they did it this way but that's not important it's just it, it was weird it was weird watching it too but I wouldn't really have cared no matter how good they did it, it was still wrong. 
Uh, people get very snarky defending it, though. Um, there's far more positive reviews at the moment than negative, which is very, very scary for me. Let's take a look, shall we? This is from Reddit. I couldn't find that many other reviews of the show because there's not on a lot of like official platforms. So take it with a grain of salt if you don't like Reddit. But uh, I won't name the users. I'm just going to read some of the comments. <laughs> but the most important thing to me, talking about episode three, was the principle this episode brought out that the followers of Christ are going to suffer a loss sometimes and that God does not promise to protect us from it all the time. What he does promise, though, is to work all things for our good. I really like the twist in line, it's not her time, referring to her resurrection. I explained in my previous video why that's completely unbiblical, them uh, making that claim. So uh, go watch that if you want to hear my response to that. I'm going to also address some of the other things they're saying. Um, what I also value about this show and this episode in particular was how they depict how Jesus does not know everything all the time. Yeah, I've actually had an issue with how often they do this on the show. It says in the gospel that Jesus knew men's hearts and their thoughts and he knew what men were like and that's why he didn't trust them. So he 100% would have known what was happening. Also, at nowhere in the gospel am I aware of does it ever say Jesus didn't know anything. It says he knew from the beginning who would betray him. I would think if he knew from the beginning who would betray him, Judas, and called him anyway, he would know if somebody was going to die. So yet again, thank you for uh, not understanding Jesus, random person on the internet. Like, why should that surprise me, right? Besides, um, as any normal person would, he's leaving to avoid being arrested, but suddenly he knows that he must instead return to the square. Yeah, so I guess he had a sixth sense about her dying, but not enough to stop it. That makes perfect sense. Why'd he come back at all then? That doesn't- that's stupid. Why'd he come back just to stand there and do nothing? Jesus healed a guy from thousands- uh, well, maybe not thousands, but several miles away. He healed a man's son in scripture. Distances not matter to God. So, you know what? He wouldn't know what was happening if he was just standing there. All right, let's see. I love this. To add to that, this is a different person. I think this will be why he was so adamant, Thomas, they're speaking of, that he see the resurrected Jesus for himself. He needs an assurance that through Rama is dead, she will live again through Jesus. I also have a theory that Quintus will be the one to lose his ear. Uh, no, it wouldn't be Quintus. It was just a Roman, like, a small foot soldier who lost his ear. Quintus is a general. Wouldn't it happen. I wouldn't be surprised if they do that, but it wouldn't have happened. And that's just petty. Yeah, I was actually the high priest's servant. So yeah, there's, there's somebody like beat me to the punch. Yeah, it wasn't a Roman officer. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. Oh, here's another one. Uh, to be fair, there are plenty of comments on this thread saying that it's incorrect or poorly done. But I'm not here to discuss why people agree with me. I'm here to to counter their other arguments so uh here's one intense and i can see why it might be considered controversial especially from a biblical truth standpoint notice they admitted that this is the scary part that ending was so powerful for two reasons one it informs on why thomas is a doubter of the groups group this is how they wrote it, but I like I want to like auto-correct their grammar mistakes, as that seems to be his defining trait in the Bible. Having the Lord incarnate right there, and he does nothing that will linger. But this goes into two. This Rama did not need earthly resurrection. She accepted Jesus as Lord. She defied her father to put Jesus first and followed him. Her dying words for for Thomas to keep following him. Why deny her the kingdom for more time on earth? And of course, it's not her time for resurrection because we know that comes for us at the end of the age. Here's another one. I agree that thematic choice, Rayma, adds an interesting dimension to the doubting Thomas motif. That's why he's such a doubter. There are many artistic choices that show has made. As example, Matthew as being quasi-autistic, which is completely fictional. He adds so much depth to the character. I do think, however, it is a bit jolting. A bit of a jo jolting choice from Jesus' characterization perspective. That he would choose to raise Lazarus, for example, but not Rayma. I see the point. 
not everyone gets their prayers answered the way they want. Example, Peter Edith's baby again fictionalized, which is true in real life. All right, uh, I think I'll just read one more. Uh, this one may actually be the worst one. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, a pretty fundamental issue faced when trying to envision a seven-ish season television adaptation of Jesus' time with his apostles in his ministry, which A, spanned a mere three years, and B, a mere, right? A mere three years. And B, is only accounted for via a group of still largely unknown authors, and depending on whether or not you believe that Matthew and John were truly the authors of the Gospels of their same names. Personally, I think that current evidence could really go either way. So I've heard compelling arguments for either side of the question. That's a whole other discussion entirely. <laughs> and, or just how much the New Testament was or wasn't tweaked to be a much more relatable, digestible, and sadly, just how useful to those in power during the tumultuous era that was late antiquity message. Oh boy. Besides that, even if we do believe the Gospels are beat-by-beat -beat accurate accounts of history, the quotes are all perfectly exact, this ridiculously brief snapshot of time. Three years. That only accounts for so much. Okay, uh, they say more, like, about how they think, like, the show's doing good because of all these creative changes, but that's really the important part. Alright, so... Oh, okay. Let's start with that last one, because that was something else, and I think I, I need to address that. That's why hearing both sides of an issue isn't always worthwhile, because people don't know what the frick they're talking about. You know, it says at the end of the Gospels that if they recounted every single th amazing thing Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to hold it. I don't know whether that is exaggerative language. I don't know what Jesus could be capable of if he wasn't bound by time or space, which he probably wasn't. Then, uh, who knows? As I said, he healed somebody from miles away. That was pre-resurrection. So yeah, um, I don't quite see the point of criticizing or commending a show that's based off the Gospels if you're going to call into question whether or not the Gospels are even reliable. Now, aside from that, the Gospels have been verified probably thousands of times by being cross-referenced with other copies of the manuscripts from many different years of history. Uh, so they're not serving any one agenda. It would probably be impossible given all the places in the world they've been found um, and what the things they say for them to serve anyone's political agenda. I don't see how they would. There's very few political statements actually in the Gospels and most of them aren't really about any one political position unless it's one that happens to support Christian values, which is a coincidence, not something that Jesus was doing intentionally. Because uh, if it was, it, he would have been trying to like take power out of the hands of politicians, and he wasn't. He was trying to turn people back to God. That's his stated mission many times. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say that the argument that we don't know exactly what Jesus did because the Gospels are so vague is utter garbage. We know what we need to know. We know enough to know that the Chosen has gone off beat, which these people admit it has done. Let's go back to that other comment I read. Do we really need backstory why Thomas was the doubter? As other people actually have pointed out, Thomas wasn't the only doubter. Plenty of people in Jesus' following doubted. All of them actually doubted when the women first told them that he'd risen from the dead. Thomas was simply the longest holdout because he was one of the only ones not in the room when Jesus appeared to the disciples when they were hiding in someone's house. It was not because uh, he was a stubborn holdout even after seeing Jesus. He did declare until I put my fingers in his wounds and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Jesus accommodated that wish, which is a bit of a funny thing to think about, but hey. God uh, really, really love us if he cares that much about stopping us from doubting, right? As for describing this scene as powerful because Rayma didn't need earthly resurrection, what a lot of hogwash. Um, Lazarus didn't need earthly resurrection either by that logic. He was a believer. He would have also gone to heaven. Jesus didn't resurrect people for their sake. He resurrected them because their families asked him to. Because they cared. You know, miracles aren't always done for the person that they happen to. Sometimes they're done for the people around them. 
God shows compassion on us. Death is a big loss and Jesus acknowledged that grief is a serious thing. He acknowledged it with Lazarus. He wept because like they were so sad that he died and so he healed him. And so we have the exact situation happening here on The Chosen. And as stupid as it would have been to have her get stabbed just to get resurrected and it would have been cheap it would have been more scripturally likely, I won't say accurate, but more in sync with Jesus' other actions if he, she'd still been resurrected. And there is no good reason for her not to be. None whatsoever. Now, if the point of the message is supposed to be that we don't always need to understand God, then it may be, you may be wondering, why am I taking such an issue with that? But yeah, I've prayed for healings and things that have not happened for me. Shouldn't I appreciate this message? Uh, not really, I don't think so. You see, uh, I actually think it's pretty selfish to dictate how someone can portray Jesus' actions just because you didn't get what you wanted in your life. It doesn't change the fact that the scripture is what it is. I don't think I should need to explain this. I don't think anyone should need to explain this. I really don't think people who are checking their Bible as they watch The Chosen should need to have this explained to them. Because a lot of people claim that they are reading the Bible while watching the show. If the show is not getting worse to you the more you read the Bible, you're not really watching it with the right attitude. Alright, which may bring me to what might be my final point, because I have talked a long time, but it's an important one. People are still just calling this, as I just read, a powerful moment. How is it powerful? In what way is it powerful to lie about Jesus? You know, it used to be doing things like that would get you kicked out of church. Uh, to the point where they did it excessively. Even when people weren't lying about Jesus, they were just saying something that someone else didn't like and that was enough to get you kicked out. I agree that that's extreme, but I respect that they cared enough about biblical accuracy to at least care if somebody was contradicting the Bible. I kind of miss those days. They seem to be long gone in the Western church. I've sat through so many sermons of people preaching stuff that I know contradicts the Bible and wishing that it was still the day when you could like, you just call it out directly without people being like, oh, you're so like judgmental. Oh, like, you just don't have the right attitude. Yeah, you need to, like, be more loving. Or, I love this, what some people are saying, not in this thread, but uh, on a different video I was watching critiquing this episode. You couldn't do better. Yeah, I couldn't do better at portraying the Bible by actually portraying the Bible. You know, I could do better, actually. Um, I could, and so could anyone. All you have to do is show what actually happened and not add insane stuff that contradicts it. Voila! You'd be doing better. Yeah, a kid could do better. A kid probably would do better, actually. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get salty. Look, this is not a book that is made up. This is the foundation of our faith. If you can frick with it, you can do anything. Okay? So, to all of you who may watch this, who will say that I am overreacting and that all of us are overreacting, um, I'm not gonna like beat around the bush. I'm, I'm not gonna like say it nice. You're wrong. You are wrong. And if that pisses you off, I do not care. And since y'all seem to have uh, no trouble attacking people who are defending the Bible, oh my gosh, Christians are attacking people who are defending the Bible. And we're not the people who are saying, it's not biblical to dance. It's not biblical to drink. No, the Bible says it's biblical to do both those things in moderation. So it's like, we're not like those uh, people with a stick up the rear ends who are going to like take one passage of the Bible and say that like this speaks for all aspects of this issue. That's not what we're doing. We are talking about the life of Jesus. You know, the person that our entire faith is based off of it. If you get something wrong about him, you could have a serious, serious problem with your faith. And if you are okay with people portraying him inaccurately, deliberately, I get that some people are just ignorant of what the Bible says and they make statements sometimes and it's forgivable. 
They may simply not remember what the Bible says. But these people are researching every single thing about this show. Uh, every season, they have to decide what they're going to take, what they're going to adapt. They have no excuse. And the Bible says that if you know what the truth is, if you know what it says, you don't do it. If you don't represent it accurately, you are without excuse. And you are a heretic. And you shouldn't be teaching. If you're going to change what Jesus did, what Jesus said, you have no right to be making a show about it. That is the end of the story. That is all there is to it. And I may be belaboring this point, but I don't think I could belabor it enough, honestly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm angry about this. I think that we all should be angry about it. The fact that so many people aren't scares me. But I know a lot of people don't read their Bible. Or if they read it, they don't respect it. I heard this story um, recently uh, of a church leader telling someone that the reason that they're not getting anything out of the Bible when they read it is because when they read it, they're looking for themselves instead of looking for God. And the person said that the leader was right. They were doing that. And when they reread the Bible after that and just looked for God, they suddenly they understood it. And I'd say that my own experience would attest that when I'm looking with, throughout the Bible with an agenda, it does fall pretty flat. When I look at it, it coming to it to learn about God, suddenly it makes sense. I mean, uh, like, I don't know why you need to say this, but the arrogance of thinking that God needs you to add to his word to make it more interesting was already an odd assumption to me about the Chosen series. Um, I got the idea of wanting to make the people Jesus talked to seem more real and relatable. However, the point of the gospel is that not that we need to look at the people Jesus talked to as role models. They're not role models for the most part. Now, when they are, Jesus lets us know that they are. Um, but that's kind of all we need to know. Jesus is our role model, not the people that he taught. They might have been good people. It doesn't really matter. Guess what? He hung out with a lot of bad people too. That's actually what he was famous for doing. So um, it was a fun idea, The Chosen, but let's be real. It was never going to stop it just to portray the disciples. It was always going to portray Jesus too, which is why no matter what they did with the disciples, they needed to be really strictly accurate with Jesus because if your, your show, you're claiming your show is showing the lives of his disciples, but you're showing Jesus in their lives in a way that's not scriptural, then you are making statements about him. I, I don't appreciate the lie that people are swallowing that that is two different things. That just because you say something is fiction, when every other aspect of it is based on scripture, except the couple of things you're tweaking, that that makes it not lying to people to tweak that. Guess what? A lot of people don't do their research. They're not going to realize that what you're doing is entirely made up. If this show is the only way that they ever like hear the story of the gospel and you completely misrepresent it, that's on you. Again, there is Christian media that takes exception like to this, like Veggie Tales, but I'm pretty sure even a stupid person could figure out that a veg talking vegetable is not an accurate portrayal of the Bible. Not much danger of them assuming that it's word for word there. On the other hand, this show is very well shot, very well researched, has historical consultants from multiple faiths that they brag about having. What's the point of saying that you're doing all this research into making this as believable as possible if you're just going to change it and then use the excuse that, oh, well, it's not like supposed to be the Bible. This reminds me of what the Christian band Skillet says about their music. Um, they say that their music is not meant to be church-level worship music. It's supposed to talk about, like, emotions and the realities of, like, dealing with a lot of um, mental health issues is kind of what their band has become about. Uh, I'm a big fan of Skillet. And I can't think of any doctrinal issue I have with any of their songs. But they acknowledge that they're, they may not be entirely biblically accurate.
But just because it's not based necessarily exactly on the Bible when they write their lyrics, does that mean that their lyrics contradict the Bible? Those are two, honey, two different things. Yes, the Bible doesn't say, to quote like one of their songs, you know, like, break the skin, spread like poison, dying slow and we all attack, how it feels to be the broken, took a piece now I'm fighting back. It doesn't say that. It does have many chapters about fighting back against evil and being willing to take up the sword and do the right thing. So, it's not contradicting the Bible to portray that attitude. No, it's not quoting the Bible. But to reiterate what I just said, not being scripturally based directly and contradicting scripture are two different things. And it seems like a lot of people in the church no longer know the difference between those two things. And it's a very important difference. That's where the chosen has fallen through apparently the cracks of critical thinking here in the Christian community for many people. Not all, there are plenty of people who agree with me. But there are many, many, many who don't. And since it keeps getting more seasons, I assume that those people outnumber the ones who don't like it. And that is concerning to me. People don't study the Bible or Christian theology that much anymore. I should know. I've been talking to people about this my entire life. And because I read the Bible and I believed it, I have had more fights with people inside the church than I've ever had with people outside of it about what the Bible teaches and about stuff that was pretty clearly stated, not stuff that was ambiguous. So I'm well aware uh, that people corrupt biblical teaching all the time in the church. And it's always made me angry from since I was a tiny little girl in Sunday school to now. And I still deal with it pretty often. I know it's not always intentional. Um, and when it's not, I don't get mad at those people. I will point out the problem. And most of the time, if they're not doing it on purpose, they accept that. And I mean, if I can give them the quote, like if I can show, yes, this is what the Bible actually says, they're cool with it. And I don't see an issue with that. None of us are going to know everything, especially when you're not like me, you haven't grown up in church. Yeah. A lot of people have a hard time reading uh, and processing what they read and visual audio media works better for them, which is precisely why we have a responsibility to make our visual and audio media accurate and scripturally sound. We're not all going to agree on every little theological thing. I expect that. But when you're making it based on the gospel, you have some pretty hard cut and dried examples to use. So if something is definitely outside the gospel and outside Jesus's words, as I've already thoroughly explained that the chosen is, that you are, as I said, without excuse. You are misleading people. That is your responsibility. Uh, I would have no issue saying this to the creators of The Chosen if I could talk to them in person. Frustratingly, I don't think they care what the opinion of a 25-year-old viewer is. That they don't care about that is rather concerning. Um, you should care about the opinion of everybody uh, if they have a good scriptural foundation. Uh, the fact that the people who are criticizing this show most often are criticizing it not for bad acting or cheesy writing, but for scriptural inaccuracy should have been the biggest red flag to the creators ever that what they were doing was starting to go off the tracks. You see, people criticize Christian media for being preachy and cheesy and unbelievable all the time. Just because it's, they say it's not how people would act. And that's a fair criticism, cinema, cinema photography wise. Um, I agree with that criticism for quite a few Christian media myself. I've seen the best and worst growing up in church. Some of the time, yeah, I admit we make garbage. However, I've seen plenty of garbage non-Christian media too, so it's definitely not just us. It's just that not everybody is good at making movies. So, not everybody has to be. I think it just depends on what your audience wants. Yeah, you shouldn't like market something as being able to compete with a Hollywood blockbuster if you don't have the ability to make something like that. But a lot of Christian content was made for like small churches and to have a good time. And yeah, until they got cocky, I never saw it as a huge issue that it was cheesy. Uh, but a bigger problem than being cheesy is being, again, heretical. Uh, I don't like that they're saying that we're essentially not smart enough to understand what they're doing by because we're criticizing it based on the Bible. We just don't understand their vision, right? 
Or maybe we do. Maybe we perfectly understand your vision. Your vision was to make something that you could say was to glorify God, but it has become about your own doctrinal ideas uh, and issues that you want to address, such as autism, disability. You're trying to answer pretty difficult questions that the Bible doesn't always give a clear answer to, and you're trying to do it using the lens of Jesus' ministry, as if you can speak for him. I don't have a problem with a Christian movie that's set, you know, around a fictional setting like most of the Kendrick's Brothers movies are, at trying to answer these questions to the best of their ability. Like the movie Courageous actually deals with the subject of loss and why it happens pretty decently. It's not perfect. They have a humble, well-meaning approach. Do I agree with it entirely? I don't know, but it's their philosophy, um, their theology, and it's their story. I don't have a problem with them making up their own story so they can talk about it. Just like the movie The Shack, which a lot more people probably have seen, talks about grief and loss. It's not completely theologically sound, in my opinion. It's not, it's not a terrible movie. Um, for what it is, I think it's good. It doesn't have to be something I completely theologically agree with, though, to get something out of it, because there are going to be at least some common themes that, as a Christian, I can agree with, even if we interpret something slightly differently. However, that story is about a man. It's fictional, for one thing, but dealing with loss in our modern era. It's at no point like taking something that Jesus did um, in the recorded Bible or taking statements in the recorded Bible and twisting them to that agenda. That's different. It's a very different matter to say the biblical stories can be changed to support your theological preferences. That's something else. You can't do that. I would say that about anything. And for the record, I don't just say this about Christian stuff. Frankly, I would say the same thing even if it was a religion I didn't believe in. Uh, if it was an Islamic movie, I'd say that they should stick to what the Quran says. No matter what their agenda uh, making like the film was. If it was a Buddhist movie, I would say the same thing. Um, if it's an atheist movie, I don't know exactly like how you'd have like a text for that. But I would say like if you do have a text you're following to make the movie, stick to what the author said. Don't change it. I call that respect for the source material. I quote people correctly when I quote them in my stories and I have never changed someone's words uh, when I quoted it uh, without making it clear I was doing it. I don't even think I've done it, but if I was gonna paraphrase, I'd make it clear it was a paraphrase, not representing their philosophy. If I had something to add to their philosophy, I would say I was adding to it. I wouldn't say they were saying it. And that, my friends, is, I believe, the end of that. That was, I know, a very, very long explanation. But as I said, I don't think you could really talk about this too much at this point. And not enough people are talking about it. So those of us who are, have no choice but to be long-winded. We can't make short little summaries of what other people have already said, because there's not a lot of people saying it. And outside the Christian community, maybe not that many people care what The Chosen is doing. But if it's supposed to be uh, supplementing our Bible, I think it should be doing it responsibly. And yeah, that's, uh, I think that's all I have to say about that. There are many other issues with The Chosen other than what I covered, but this one is probably the final straw of no return. You couldn't salvage the story after this point. It's impossible. And I think from seeing what they're going to do looking ahead, it's not going to happen. And it's cheap in debt, and it's misrepresenting Jesus. And I think that's my final statement, that if you have to misrepresent Jesus to make a good show about Jesus and his followers, then you're not making a good show about Jesus' followers. You're making your idea of it. That's arrogant, and it's wrong. And, uh, you know, attack me if you want for saying that. I don't care. I might not even delete your comments even if like they're insulting because I literally do not care what you say 
about me for defending the Bible. I do care what you say about God. Uh, not that God needs me to defend him, but uh, just because he doesn't need it doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. It's a respect thing. Just the same way like uh, you defend your family whether they need it or not. You don't let people talk crap about your family unless you're a poor family member. Do you let people talk crap about your friends? Do you let people misrepresent their character? If you wouldn't do that with a human being, but you would do it with God, sorry, but you're the problem. Not the Bible. The Bible is not the problem. You are. If the Bible is making your show look inaccurate, guess what? The show is the problem, not the Bible. That is the end of the matter. It's finished. It's done. I have no more to say. I don't care if that was strong language. It's about time somebody used it honestly. So with that, I will say goodbye to you all. Thank you for watching. Of course, more videos of the usual kind are coming, but thanks for watching this if you did. Sayonara, and peace out.